Ladies and gentlemen, persecution and war have forced as many people as never before to leave their homes. However, most of them have very limited access to education without a pandemic. And now, this access is doubly affected by COVID-19. Today in this conference, we will discuss the impact of COVID-19 on refugee protection, but with a particular focus on refugee education. And ahead of the World Refugee Day tomorrow, we will seek for answers and also what lessons can be learned and which opportunities arise from the pandemic on education as a building block of resilient societies. But most important, how can we keep education for refugees going on during COVID-19? So ladies and gentlemen, stay with us the next two and a half hours and discuss with our experts, volunteers, and former refugees from around the world who are working on education and refugee protection during this pandemic. This event will set the scene for the Amplify Now virtual refugee conference on World Refugee Day tomorrow, which is organized also by Kiron. Kiron, an educational platform for refugees worldwide. And this event can now be seen live on Facebook, I hope so, and YouTube, but we also record this session so it can be watched later. I have one last technical information for you. You, as our guests, our viewer, can also attend and join our discussion by writing your questions and remarks into the chat, which I will pass on later on to our experts. And finally, one last information for you, the breakout sessions later that can communicate directly with our experts. But now it's time to meet our first keynote speaker. Bahati Hatege Kimana is originally from Rwanda and has lived for most of her life in Kenya as a refugee. In 2019, she graduated with a nursing degree from Moy University. Bahati is also a DAFI graduate. DAFI stands for Deutsche Albert Einstein Flüchtlingsinitiative. And she's currently serving as a UN volunteer with UNHCR in Kenya. Welcome, Bahati. We are very happy to have you with us. Your stage. Greetings to you all. It is my humble honor to speak before you on this day that we honor and celebrate people who have been displaced from their countries. I am a girl like any other. My name is Bahati Ernestine. I live in Kenya and have lived here for the past 24 years as a refugee. My parents fled our homeland, Rwanda, when I was just a few weeks old. And all I have known as home is Kenya. I have had the privilege through scholarships to get an education. I have gone through primary school, secondary school, and my university as well. Through the Duffy Scholarship, I was able to graduate last year with a degree in nursing. And at a time like this, last year, I was in Berlin, Germany at a conference 
representing the 1% of refugee youth who have access to tertiary education. This was a very momentous occasion for me because I had the opportunity to showcase how much education can change a person's future, how much growth it can influence. For my career, I chose a path in the medical field and specifically in nursing. This choice was influenced by my journey from having come from a country torn apart by war to my life as a refugee. I needed a skill that would give me control, that would put me in a position to be useful, to be helpful in case there is need, whether it is war or whether it is a pandemic like now. Last year, I began my internship at Kenyatta National Hospital here in Nairobi. And thinking back, I could not have thought that what has happened this year was going to happen and that I would be part of the team that would be responding to COVID-19 in our hospitals. I feel very honored to be part of those who are taking care and, and supporting the healthcare system in this pandemic and it has been a great learning experience it has been a very fulfilling and very satisfactory experience so far a lot of refugees like myself have been empowered to contribute to the response on COVID-19 I see very many youth involved in bridging the gap between the between passing the messages about coronavirus and how the communities can protect themselves to the refugee communities, acknowledging that there is a great barrier in terms of language, in terms of literacy. And by doing this, refugee youth find themselves through education in a position to fill the gap, to aid their communities. We also have a lot of refugee-led organizations that are involved in fundraising, in, in amassing resources to provide food, to provide water, to provide soap, to provide masks and sanitizers for refugee families, and not only them, but also the vulnerable in the host communities. This whole pandemic, in my opinion, has put us in a place where we acknowledge each other's vulnerabilities. We acknowledge that we are together in this. And I'm so happy to see so many refugees and so many of the host communities coming together to fight this pandemic. I also recognize that we are in a very precarious position. The fact that we are refugees in a foreign country with very limited resources, our living conditions, our limited access to basic things such as water, such as soap, sanitizers, masks, and even food. So this is a great challenge to refugees in the camps, in settlements, and even in the urban areas. Aside from that, because of the powerlessness and the hopelessness, refugees find themselves facing mental health challenges. Some will fall into depression, some will be anxious. We have a lot of refugee youth who cannot go to school anymore, who are stuck in their homes and can barely have you know, lunch or supper, who have to survive on one meal or if any at all. And for those who are in school, it's they are anxious about it, they are worried, they have no access to what others have, internet, mobile phones, to continue their learning online, and uh, sometimes when they were in school, maybe they had access to food, they could have lunch, they could have supper, but now they are at homes and things at home are different. For the youth who are working, they are no longer going to work. They have turned to desperate measures to fend for themselves and their families as well. I would like on this day to urge us all to sit and think about refugees. How are they doing? What are they eating? For the students, how are they learning? For those who are working, how are they paying their rent? How are they meeting their needs? As we think about this, let us think about how much change education can make, 
how much empowering one refugee can trickle down to others in the communities and not just that even to future generations for women they can educate their children and their children after that also refugee led organizations they need a lot of support they are on the ground and they are heavily involved in taking care of their own communities as well as the host communities they need support a good example of refugees coming together is the 4U challenge that is headed by the Global Youth Advisory Council and also by the Tertiary Refugee Students Network. These are refugee youth all over the world who have come together to show that they are doing something for you, for refugees, for host communities. They are responding to this pandemic in one way or another. And doing this, they are also sharing messages, encouraging messages, precautionary messages to their communities in ways that they will understand. And this is a great example of what education can do and how much power education can give towards making a change for all of us. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Bahati, for your kind words. Thank you. We're going to go into the discussion later on with you. But we, um, I would like to introduce to you our guests, our panelists we have here. Just a quick introduction that you all know who is with us today. Um, we have Sajid Malik here. He is director of the Division of Resilience and Solutions at the headquarter of UNHCR. Ronald Anthony Münch is our guest. He is from the German Federal Foreign Office. A very warm welcome to you. Emma Wagner from London. Emma is Senior Education Policy and Advocacy Advisor at Save the Children. And her responsibility is education in emergencies. And we have Tobias Ernst with us. He is CEO from Kira. I would like to introduce to you our next speaker, Sajid Malik. The refugee issue is critical even without a pandemic, Mr. Malik, as I said before. And for those who stand at the, at the sidelines, anyway, are even more affected right now. But there are also very good examples how refugees can continue to get education. Could you give us a little bit of an insight what situation we are right in now and what are the good examples for the education in this pandemic? Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Bahadi. Such a powerful statement. Dear colleagues, um, my colleagues on the, on, 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 on the call here, but also distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, um, it is honestly, uh, honestly a, a great pleasure to appear in this interactive discussion. It's a very important topic. Uh, generally, normally it's a very important topic, the education, but now in the, in the, in the, in the midst of COVID, um, the impact which so uh, eloquently explained by Bahati how she's facing and her other refugees in Kenya, uh, to her community that is facing the impact of COVID on refugees, but also on education. Um, I would like to bring some, some points to the, uh, to the attention of this discussion as the Director of uh, Division of Resilience and Solutions. This division includes most of the technical areas that have been heavily involved in our uh, response to the COVID crisis. Uh, this includes uh, the public health. Uh, my team that, uh, that I work with has experts on public health and they are the ones steering the health response uh, globally. We have in our team hygiene, mental health and psychosocial support. Behati highlighted some of the issues that are faced by uh, refugees globally in the midst of this COVID crisis. We have cash in our team that is looking after some of these responses that are taking place globally, livelihoods, and above all, uh, most importantly, that we're discussing today, 
is the education part of it. But before I continue to share some of uh, the details about our response, I would like to use the opportunity to share with you um, the latest displacement numbers that were released uh, yesterday, in fact. It's a day before the refugee, um, tra refugee day. This is taking the World Refugee Day tomorrow. Uh, so the, normally, it's around this time that we release our global trend reports. And this report shows that there are 79.5 million uh, were displaced at the end of 2019. UNHCR has not seen such a higher number before. This is the highest number I can, I, we, can, we can imagine that we have seen over the years that we have. So it's now reached a unprecedented level of 79.5 million. That means that the forced displacement is now affecting more than 1% of humanity. And this is a, a, a massive number that we've reached the displacement level that it is 1% of the humanity. That means one in every 97 persons is displaced. And with all of these numbers, there are an estimated 30 to 34 million children in these numbers. Uh, if you could just imagine that the entire population of Australia, Denmark and Mongolia combined, that would be the number of children that are displaced within this 79.5 million that we look at the displaced population. <clears throat> The annual increase uh, from a figure of 70.8 million at the end of 2018 as a result of two main issues. One, there's still conflicts going on and there are worrying trends, particularly in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Sahel, Yemen, and Syria, where I was stationed in Damascus from 2015 to 2019. And I saw for the with first hand the destruction, displacement, and how people were impacted, especially children, under brutal ISIS control in villages and towns that they were there in Raqqa and other areas. And the education was so important for them that they've missed out for all those years, especially girls in those areas. I saw that for first hand for a number of years, just returning from there. <clears throat> Second is the better presentation of statistics and registration numbers from the Venezuelan situation. Uh, none of them were not legally registered as refugees or asylum seekers but for whom protection sensitive arrangements were required. On top of it, we now face a unique situation and, and Bahati has highlighted the impact of uh, challenges of the COVID pandemic, which deepens the existing challenges faced by refugees, persons of concerns, asylum seekers. It threatens overall development gains that were made in the past several years for self-reliance, a number of uh, <clears throat> Refugees are on daily wage basis, lockdowns, uh, closures. They are not able to earn income. They are not able to pay their rents. They are not able to pay their school fees. They are not even pay able to pay um, the, the, the shelter that they would have for a night to be able to sleep under, under shade. Now, in many of these places, refugees are sleeping in the rough because they do not have uh, the means to support themselves. COVID-19 is negatively impacting the ability of people to secure basic living, uh, food security, uh, basic needs, as we can look. On top of that, the challenges to access to education for refugee children, more than 1.6 billion, as we know the numbers, and youth have been affected because of school closures, and among them are refugee children. UNHCR is working with governments and partners to maintain the momentum generated by the Global Compact on Refugees. This took place in 2018. And then the Global Refugee Forum, which took place towards the end of last year in December 2019, to support the efforts to strengthen refugee resilience and reduce their vulnerabilities. This work has been going on, and this is even more relevant now than ever before in, in the pandemic that we have. UNICEA recently released a new paper explaining how key principles of the Global Compact, such as burden and responsibility sharing, protection and inclusion, can help support refugees and host communities. Bahati gave some examples how host communities are equally destitute and vulnerable and they need to be supported as well. I would now like to speak specifically about education as this is the main theme of that. The COVID-19 epidemic has, uh, pandemic rather, has led to an unprecedented situation where schools have been disrupted for almost 1.6 billion children, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and partial closure of schools in efforts to contain the spread of virus. Um, higher um, education institutions have also suspended classes 
As of late April, UNESCO estimates that 91% of those enrolled in formal education programs have been affected. This is a large number, especially when I gave the, the number of totally displaced globally at this stage now. In these challenging times, displaced and refugee students are at a particular disadvantage, and there's a risk that progress um, in increased enrollment may be eroded. We have been struggling, we've been working very hard over the years, including with, with the number of uh, uh, donors and support that we get, and that can be affected. The suspension of school feeding programs could affect the nutrition and health status of refugee children and youth. As many governments move to at-home learning modalities, many children are disadvantaged as they experience uneven access to distance education and online learning opportunities as connectivity and hardware is not available and, and language classes are not available as well. <clears throat> Therefore, I'm really looking forward to hearing more from our colleagues, partners and refugees from different field examples on how they have managed to continue learning despite these difficult circumstances. Children are resilient, they always find a way and we need to support them. Let me specifically thank the German government, who is one of the most important partners for UNHCR. We just released the global uh, trend report, as I mentioned, and Germany is the third largest refugee hosting country now. Uh, it's generally, generously hosting uh, over 1.5 million uh, after, if you look at it, Turkey, Colombia, and Germany. So one of the la third largest refugee hosting country. But the Federal Foreign Ministry Office has also generously supported our COVID-19 emergency appeal while maintaining its significant funding for ongoing humanitarian and protection operations worldwide. <clears throat> At the Global Refugee Forum in December last year, Germany demonstrated its focus on education with pledges both in domestic and international context. The Federal Foreign Office is also our main partner for our tertiary education Duffy, as um, was mentioned earlier there. <clears throat> Through this substantial support, we could enable over 8,200 refugee students in Bahati is an example sitting there, uh, who has been um, so ably now contributing to the community's work there. So this 8,200 refugee students in 54 countries to study in university. Over 20% of them study a health-related major, which in this pandemic, becoming even more important. We have seen many good examples uh, where DAFI graduates are now contributing to this, to this work in this pandemic in many countries. <clears throat> I think through Behadi's keynote, um, which was so eloquently she presented, you have witnessed the tenacity and commitment of refugees themselves in making a difference in the world. The importance of being able to support the commitment through such scholarships and the opportunities, and then being able to refugees to contribute so meaningfully cannot be underestimated. And we want to learn more from this experience and we would like to take this forward. I'm looking forward to the discussion and we would um, learn from this and, and improve the way that we are, we are working towards this. With this, I pass it back to you, Hati. Thank you so much, Mr. Malik, for your very important words and all. Um, You've said, um, yes, children are resilient and um, there are a huge number of refugees, but you also told us about um, the big chances we have now. And the thank goes directly to you, Mr. Munch, to your office and uh, about the huge number of refugees Germany is hosting right now. You were talking about the field examples, Mr. Malik, and we prepared four videos with field examples. And I would like to introduce you to our first video, and it's from Jordan. In our first video, refugee students from Jordan explain how they have managed, managed digital learning during the COVID-19 pandemic. Please, the video. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Zaina Jadan, Education Officer from UNHCR Jordan Office. I am very delighted to be participating in the conference this afternoon, although virtually, and I will be shedding the light on the 
online and distant learning programs in Jordan. UNHCR Jordan office has worked closely with the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Higher Education on scientific research to support the ministries in expanding their approach towards blended and online learning. These investments have shown to be very fruitful during the pandemic of COVID-19, where it has indeed facilitated the learners' smooth shift into online learning. I think e-learning saves our future. Because without it, we may stay at home not studying, waiting for states to open and return to the universities. Also, by joining distance learning, you can save both money and time that is spent and traveling to the educational institution. Also, this gave me a lot of flexibility. Like now I can organize my time and the schedule. It helps the learner to depend totally on himself and reduces the individual differences between the learners. I started with Karen before a year. I was a teacher, then I was a teacher, and I was a teacher. I studied courses with Karen, like any teacher, I learned from her. It helped me to start my own company. It helped me to start my own company, and it helped me to start my own company. It will be a great idea for me to start my own company. And a very good thing for e-learning that lectures were being recorded. I can watch recorded videos and notes that is uploaded by the lecturer anytime and anywhere. The biggest disadvantage of this system for a medical student that there is no practice. Not all of us can attend on time because they don't have a smartphone or a computer. Internet access is often not available. During the unexpected moment, students are out of schools, but that doesn't mean education is on hold. Our universities made a good thing by making online lectures. In this way, they save us. Because without that, we may lost this semester and re-enter it again. Thank you very much and um, great examples. Um, in, the, in this video with the field, field examples uh, where we can see how students, especially now here in, in, in Jordan, um, manage to learn and continue their learnings in this pandemic. Um, Sajid Malik mentioned uh, the German government, that the German government hosts a lot of refugees, does a lot of, uh, is, is active in refugee protection and also in refugee education and I would like to introduce you now to our next guest. It's Mr. Ronald Anthony Münch. He is head of the Division of Higher Education, Science and Research at German Federal Foreign Office. Welcome Mr. Münch. Well thank you very much and I hope I can be heard and can be seen. Yes, perfectly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Perfectly. you so much. And I would like to welcome all uh, participants and uh, Paul also the panelists um, to this uh, to this event. And maybe just um, would like also to thank in particular UNHCR and the Chiron um, organization for organizing this uh, event today, which is, as you pointed out already, um, part of the so-called long night of ideas. The long night today starts already in this morning, so it's really a long day of um, several events which we have and the philosophy of this is to share ideas, to discuss ideas, to share information, to reach out actually to a lot of people who have maybe not been so far introduced to, um, um, to these uh, ideas, to these programs and projects uh, which we are running together with our partners. The idea is also to make sure that uh, the partners which we have been working together very successfully in the last years and also the new partners which joined uh, several of our projects um, in um, <clears throat> just uh, shortly before um, that they have been that there is a possibility to discuss together with them and the broader audience um, the work we are doing or the ideas which we want to follow. Uh, just this as a, as a short remark and indeed uh, with regard to the response um, to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I think um, what we have just heard um, from Mr. Malik is of course a, a very disturbing um, information that this huge, um, um, this, this huge number of um, 
let's just say 80 million people um, um, forcibly uh, displaced. I mean, this is this is really um, something which is um, yeah, uh, which gives us a lot of a uh, lot of work to do. And um, I um, think the pandemic is, of course, something which is adding to these problems which we are facing. Um, the Global Compact on Refugee provides, in our view, already a blueprint for an effective and comprehensive response and gives also valuable instruments in our hands, which we can draw upon now. Um, so Germany supports the approach of UNHCR to pay particular attention to pledges made at the uh, Global um, <clears throat> Refugee Forum focusing on health and uh, livelihoods on the water and sanitation and hygiene uh, programs and uh, of course all the um, programs on economic and social inclusion. Um, it is not despite but because of the pandemic that we should make all efforts to implement and of course potentially adapt or fast track these pledges which have been made. And when it comes to, to Germany, indeed, um, we, we do think this is uh, a, particular, um, a particular impetus of our work to, um, to um, give support. And we pledged an additional 100 million at the Global Refugee Forum of funding for UNHCR in 2020 and substantial development oriented funding. And as of June 2020 now, so half a year later, we have provided more than 340 million euro humanitarian funding to UNHCR's operation worldwide, including, of course, dedicated uh, funding also to the responses uh, UNHCR is giving to uh, the pandemic of COVID. Um, and that goes, of course, in addition to the um, development oriented funding, which we are also providing. So this is one part of our efforts which we are ongoing. In addition, in April, we have also included when it comes to particular to education um, in the universities, and we have providing another 50 million euro for refugees studying in Germany. Um, and this is particularly important because these programs which we have run already in the past has to be beefed up in order to make sure that these particular um, these particular uh, challenges which we are now facing also in Germany for these particular group of students that we can cope with them and um, of course also make possible that we provide digital teaching formats for them and also hardware which is of course an important uh, part of these um, um, challenges. So, um, so we have a lot of other programs which we are running also worldwide, um, but with regard to the time which is available, I would like also to focus in, again um, on the um, DAFI program and I would like to thank, of course, again, um, Bahati for this um, um, keynote speech and also for her presence at the um, conference in Berlin, which um, was actually a kind of kickoff last June where we started to, um, to <clears throat> develop a stronger philosophy on including um, the educational aspect in our work when it comes to refugees. This part also of our philosophy of a new kind of um, science diplomacy, which we would like to adopt, that makes sure that we uh, work together with new partners and also with partners which we have been right already for a long time, like the UNHCR, in order to make sure that we can outreach to these people who need the education. We do think education and the entrance to the possibility of education is a very, very strong instrument in order to cope with this situation which we are facing um, now in particular, but which we have been facing already for a long time and which we unfortunately will continue to face uh, also in the, in the future. So um, the DAFI program is a very important subject uh, uh, in this, um, within this philosophy. And I would also like to inform you that um, <clears throat> already in, um, in the Global Refugee Forum in Geneva um, last December, Denmark has joined to support the DAFI scholarship program. Probably a lot of you are already aware of that. And since then also the Czech Republic has become a partner of this program. So we are happy well, uh, really to welcome these two partners and we will be very happy to welcome further 
contributors to this program because we do think that this program gives also in the future a very strong pillar to our work, to our common work and efforts in order to support um, education to refugees. So maybe with these um, very briefly short remarks, I would like to uh, give it back to you and uh, we'll be happy, of course, to respond to questions and of course to give also additional information later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Munch. And um, I just uh, got the information that we have um, hundreds of viewers from all over the world, from the UK, from Sri Lanka, from Canada, from Tanzania, and from Somaliland, not Somalia, Somaliland, a very little tiny uh, country, and of course, from Germany. And I would like to introduce you to our next guest, we talked about it earlier, you have a very German name, but it's not German, she's from London. <laughs> Hello, Emma Wagner. I would like to introduce you a little bit. Emma Wagner is Senior Education Policy and Advocacy Advisor at the Save the Children with responsibility for education in emergencies. And currently she's leading Save the Children's education response in the COVID-19 pandemic the campaign Save Our Education. Emma, could you um, give us a little bit uh, an insight and especially uh, what do you as Save the Children expect from civil society in a pandemic and how do you see in this pandemic the role of the UNHCR? Thank you so much. Um, it's really great to be joining this panel today. Um, so civil society plays a really strong role in responding to um, the challenge of education for refugees in, a, in normal situations, but during COVID has a really strong role. And at this time, Save the Children is listening to children and families and working around the clock to respond to, 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 respond to their needs during this pandemic. We're adapting and expanding existing work to keep children safe healthy and continuing their learning. We have decades of experience in delivering quality learning opportunities in some of the most challenging humanitarian contexts. So now we're capitalizing on that experience to respond quickly and effectively to the learning needs of the most marginalized children, particularly refugees. So our priorities have been to fill the gaps in government response to distance learning while schools are closed, ensure that psychosocial support is continued, helping to prepare for the safe return to school and making sure the most marginalized groups such as refugees are not forgotten about in the national response. So we have been providing no or low tech distance learning across multiple countries where refugees live. We've adapted our return to learning program, which aims to get refugee children back into school within 90 days of their displacement. So instead of the usual classroom teaching for this program, We've now moved to online support via WhatsApp, such as messages, voice notes and videos, and other platforms such as regular phone calls with caregivers and children and paper handouts. And this is being done in places such as Lebanon and Colombia. And we're also providing home learning packs to 100,000 children in Uganda, many of which are refugees and where access to technology is very limited. And throughout the crisis, we have surveyed many children who tell us that they feel isolated and confused and fearful for the future. Some of this has already been mentioned by um, Bahati, some of the challenges, the mental health challenges that refugees are facing. And so we have provided guidance to parents and caregivers to ensure that they have the right information to support their children's well-being at home. And this includes tips for parents and caregivers to support their children's well-being. And this has been translated into five languages and the My Hero Is You book, which has been translated into a hundred languages. We have also really prioritised uh, making sure that children can return safely to school when it's safe to do so. And governments and the international community need to plan now for the safe reopening of schools. So we've developed the Safe Back to School Practitioner's Guide, which has been endorsed by the Global Education Cluster and the Protection Area of Responsibility. And this guide is very relevant for a range of settings where refugees live. There's a particular section on camp settings, 
And we know that colleagues who are working in refugee camps tell us that this guide has been particularly useful in planning wash, uh, water and sanitation for school and social distancing in classrooms and planning back to school campaigns that target refugee youth um, who may feel like they want to drop out of the education system that they're in. And we've also launched our global Save Our Education campaign to call on the international community for a more coordinated and well-funded education response to the crisis. And we'll be publishing a report in mid-July, which will include policy and funding recommendations based on the evidence from our programming across lots of different countries. And I was also asked to provide a bit of an update um, on the work that the Interagency Network for Education in Emergencies Advocacy, work has, Advocacy Working Group has been doing, of which I'm a member. Um, we've been playing a very active role um, in the Global Refugee Forum back in December, which has already been mentioned, but we're also playing quite a strong role in following up from that Global Refugee Forum. A number of different pledges were made on education, and we want to make sure the momentum at that forum isn't lost. And six months on for the forum, it's a really good time now to reflect on the engagement at the forum and how much progress has actually been made on the pledges. So today, INEE, which is a strong interagency network, will be publishing a blog sharing some initial analysis of the kinds of pledges that have been made for education for refugees. And it includes um, how many pledges were made in certain regions, what part of the education system, such as early childhood development, primary, receive the most kinds of pledges and what kinds of pledges, be they, be they uh, financial or policy or programming, and where there are gaps that still remain in the response. So we need much deeper analysis of these pledges on education made at the Global Refugee Forum to understand the trends and gaps in response against the learning needs of refugees in different countries. So INEE will continue to do this work through a number of virtual roundtables in July to hear the perspectives of a range of different stakeholders in different regions. And the, the roundtables will be held in different languages. So I really encourage um, colleagues joining today on, on this panel, on this um, discussion, to join um, the virtual roundtable where you can participate and give your thoughts about uh, the refugee education challenge right now and how COVID is really impacting that. And also in today's blog, INEE states that pro the progress it has made against its own pledges. And we join with UNHCR in calling for all organisations, governments and the private sector who have made pledges on education for refugees to report regularly on the progress they have made. So I'm encouraging you all to look out for the Save the Children report in a few weeks. Uh, look at today's INEE blog and do join the virtual roundtables in July. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Emma, um, for this very deep insight of your work, work from Save Your Children. It's very important work, as we learned. And um, I would like to um, go further with the second video we have from East Africa, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And in this video, another field example of education in the pandemic shows the instant network schools as good practice and also the partnership with the Vodafone Foundation. Please, the video. Due to this coronavirus, the schools has been closed, but the education should go on and should not stop up to there.
thank you very much for the video. Um, I would like to introduce now our next guest. It's Tobias Ernst. He's CEO from Chiron. Chiron just uh, just started in April, as I read. In April. Two years ago. Oh, okay. And um, Mr. Ernst is the Chief Executive Officer of the Kiron Open Higher Education and is responsible for the strategic direction of Kiron in the future. Um, Mr. Ernst, what are the benefits? You must know that as the chef of Kiron, what are the benefits of connected education programs, especially in the COVID-19 pandemic? I'm back. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to do so. Um, yeah, maybe just briefly about uh, Chiron, one or two sentences. Uh, Chiron is a digital NGO. We are five years old uh, and we want to serve refugees worldwide. Our mission is to provide learning opportunities for academic, professional and personal growth by digital means. We want to, in particular, offer a safe space online where refugees feel as part of a community, empowered and can gain some hope as they can invest into their future and the future of their families. I think I don't have to elaborate in general on the role and power of education. I think at this stage of the conference uh, and yeah, in general, this is uh, pretty clear. The good news uh, is, so to say, uh, that we can see over the course of the last months, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, and this is a kind of proof point I want to deliver here, that uh, digital learning opportunities or connected learning can really make a difference uh, as, uh, yeah, if you have the means and if you have the connectivity and the devices uh, and the offerings, of course, then you can really set up effective learning opportunities without uh, being in one classroom, of course. We all know the advantages of uh, learning in person and uh, blended learning, but uh, I think the uh, yeah, possibilities to deliver valuable learning opportunities online uh, developed a lot over the last years. And so, especially uh, if you cannot have uh, other settings, digital learning can really make a difference. And as I said, we see it in our numbers, uh, the student registrations and also the activity per students. Uh, they, these numbers were rising a lot over the course of the last three months. Uh, the bad news, and uh, Mr. Malik already uh, reported the current uh, yeah, depressing and uh, catastrophic developments and numbers. The bad news, of course, is that we have to invest much more, that we have to strengthen our activities here and, and very much accelerate uh, what, what we do right now to really uh, serve the needs we see and the developments uh, we face. Um, and in this regard, I think there are some, some bottlenecks I would, I would like to mention in general, where we have to see how to overcome these uh, bottlenecks. And of course, uh, there, some are very general, uh, like time. So people have to have time to make use of learning opportunities. There is, of course, language. In particular, uh, uh, many uh, students want to learn languages, uh, and this is always difficult to do so, especially, of course, online. Uh, there you have to have very good programs to offer language learning online, uh, or you go the other way around uh, to offer content in local languages. There you have this translation problem, uh, which is also a lot of effort to offer high value content in local languages. So there are many bottlenecks. And of course, coming to the more technical side, devices are one aspect too. But uh, today I would like to take the opportunity um, to point uh, to the direction of connectedness or let's say access to internet. Also related to the video we just saw, we do think uh, that next to more efforts and more investments in all fields I, I just uh, mentioned, uh, more investments in terms of Wi-Fi access and therefore internet access 
would be most valuable. Don't want to say, yeah, don't want to compare uh, the options, uh, but uh, as I said, I would like to strengthen this point here today that we do see even more than the lack of devices, a strong lack and demand uh, of, of internet access. And we think that it would be very valuable and a very good investment to strengthen our activities in this regard, uh, to connect people better to the internet uh, and to yeah, ask ourselves in the projects and programs we have, whether we invest enough in uh, connectivity and access to internet, because the offerings, and this is not just Chiron, there are many offerings uh, for vulnerable populations and, and uh, refugee uh, populations in particular. There are many offerings in the internet uh, available, and so uh, investments in Wi-Fi and internet connection would be my recommendation. Uh, and yeah, what I all, what I ask us all to deliver more in this regard. And where we are happy to to uh, join alliances, so to say, to move this forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ernst. I said Kiron, you said Chiron. It must be Chiron, but I just heard you can say both. Kiron, Chiron. And we all know what it means when you say Kiron or Chiron. Thank you very much for this insight. And I would like to show you our third video we have prepared for you. It's from West Africa. And in this video, it addresses the continued learning in low tech environment. Hello, my name is Charlotte Berquin and I work for UNHCR as Regional Education Officer for the West and Central Africa region. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the continuity of learning of 140 million children across the 21 countries of the region, including refugee children who are included in national education systems in all these countries. The negative outcomes of prolonged school closures are likely to disproportionately impact the almost 3 million children of concern to UNHCR in the region, who not only see their education interrupted, but also lose the safety offered by a school and get exposed to a higher risk of abuse, neglect, violence and exploitation. Education was a major challenge across the region even before the COVID situation and rising insecurity has an enormous impact on access of refugee children to education. Across the Central Sahel, threats and attacks on schools and against teachers and students are more and more common. As of February of this year, and right before the schools closed because of the COVID-19 pandemic, almost 4,000 schools had closed or been destroyed in attacks in Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger. In these three countries only, over 8 million children are currently out of schools. And this is only for the Central Sahel. I'm not talking about the Lake Chad Basin crisis, nor the Anglophone crisis in Cameroon, where thousands of schools are still closing because of insecurity. In this context, UNHCR's education response in the region focuses on ensuring that learning places offer protection and safety. Je m'appelle Faida Alida, je suis réfugiée rwandaise, étudiante boursière à Dafi en troisième année d'économie et de gestion. Depuis le mois de mars, les cours se sont arrêtés. Cependant, le gouvernement a mis en place un système de cours à distance à travers la télé et l'Internet. Malheureusement, beaucoup de réfugiés n'y ont pas accès, faute de moyens. Je donne bénévolement des cours de soutien à domicile aux réfugiés candidats au baccalauréat avec l'accord de leurs parents. Nous sommes ainsi une vingtaine d'étudiants réfugiés et tchadiens à appuyer une centaine de candidats réfugiés. Je profite également de ces séances pour sensibiliser aux bons gestes à adopter face au Covid-19. Malgré cette situation difficile, je reste une membre active pour ma communauté, car chacun peut agir, chaque geste compte. Plan International and UNHCR conducted a survey to understand the impact of the COVID-19 pandemics uh, among refugees, students in Cameroon, with particular focus on the education sector. So 142 students were interviewed. Majority of them had adopted distance learning as an approach during the period, using mainly Zoom, 
Google Classrooms, social media such as WhatsApp. And the mobile phone was the main tool that uh, those students are currently using as only 10% of them have access to uh, a, a tablet or a computer. 17% of the group we met was particularly stressed and anxious due to the uncertainty to complete the academic year. Uh, some suggestions were made by the students and most of them expressed the need for more laptops, internet devices, especially uh, USB flash drives and connectivity, which will allow them to access the courses more frequently. They also suggested some refresher training to happen after uh, the periods, uh, which is what we are working on now, collecting the support materials and making them available for, for the children. Well, we are back. Um, I would like to um, start with a little bit of a reflection what we heard from the other guests and also what we have seen in the videos. Um, Mr. Malik, let me start with you. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more what UNHCR is doing concretely on education response during the pandemic? Thank you very much to um uh, other panelists and and such rich videos that we we see the the situation in different um, locations and it's across the globe um, uh, some initiatives that are taking place um, which are important to recognize and see how we we can can build on those um, but also to see the challenges there so let me just give a little bit of reflection that the, when the pandemic started um, you know refugees uh, are often in uh, and marginalized areas. There are areas in underdeveloped within even the country that they are not in in the main areas where they have access to internet, you have access to other services and all the rest. Many of these are very living in a very remote areas. Uh, but despite all these challenges, I would say that the inclusion of refugees in the health response was um, relatively uh, encouraging, I would say. Not always an easy thing to do, but we were able to convince um, uh, the governments that if one is not safe, no one is safe, basically, in the health, health side of it. The pandemic uh, it discriminates uh, no one in this, and then everybody can be affected. So I think the health side was very much a, a, an encouragement, encouraging uh, response that we see coming from all sides. The problem now begins when we have the socioeconomic impact and impact on, on the education and other sectors. That is the inclusion of that is, is a much bigger challenge. And what we are now actively pursuing with all is that um, refugees should be included in, in response strategies, national response strategies, to ensure that their learning continues because many of the countries have good uh, systems in place. You heard from our colleagues uh, and different responses that are put in place in different um, regions. They are still struggling to make sure that children do have access to these, uh, to these um, uh, opportunities that are available for nationals. In some places, even nationals do not have access to those areas. So we need to make sure that refugees and nationals are part of the, the strategies. So that's, that's one is the inclusion in the national response strategies of, of that. The second we see that the adolescent girls are particularly at risk. And we have seen this in many situations. Um, um, here, um, for extended periods if they're out of school, um, and I, I can uh, only highlight the, the risks that you all very well know, uh, it's the gender-based violence. There'll be um, early marriages. There'll be risks of them not returning to school at all uh, because they've missed schools for a number of months and, and they'll find it extremely hard to catch up. Families who have lost income, uh, particularly if they are um, in urban areas, they would most likely prioritize uh, education of boys going back and not, not girls going back to school. Uh, there are lots of areas that we need to be mindful of that. 
um, the learning at home, um, their phases that are there, which provide some opportunities, or when school reopens, we want to make sure that the adolescent girls, there is specific focus on that, and they go back to school. And that's very much a, a component of the strategy that we are pursuing. Um, then there are, um, there are already inequalities. Um, if we look at the statistics uh, of, of our uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary level compared to global statistics of um, enrollment, refugee children are way, way below on that. We are struggling to, to work towards uh, better, better uh, yeah, opportunities for refugee children than they can have. Now, this uh, pandemic, uh, there's a risk that these inequalities could be exacerbated uh, because now it's resources. It is, uh, some of the refugee hosting countries are very, very generous. Um, we heard from um, the, the contribution Germany is making. One is Duffy, but that's, that's uh, a massive contribution that has been put in. But then being a host country, they've opened up their institutions. They have given resources, uh, making sure the vocational training is there. <clears throat> There are many countries who are providing these opportunities, but not all because the resources are limited. And that's where the pledges that were made are absolutely essential for us to understand uh, and then move towards um, uh, operationalizing those, those pledges. 80 of those pledges at the, at the Global Refugee Forum out of 204 uh, around pledges that were made, 80 pledges were made by states. We need to make sure that this is now the time to implement those pledges. More than ever, the need is now that the global compact on refugees, the burden sharing, responsibility sharing is looked into, but these situations will need some support and I think we'll need to look into that. But it's very important that these inequalities do not exacerbate and do not accept that. Then the other area is, um, a return to schools. Many schools have been closed. Um, as in, and, and, and we know that because we are also coordinating the, the response to pandemic, in many of these situations, <clears throat> sorry, ex especially in Africa and in parts of Asia, uh, the COVID curve has not even reached the peak and, and our modeling uh, with the institutions that we're looking at the spread of the virus is, is, um, is still happening and can spread even more, which means um, the schools are shut down, the, the education system will, in, this, in these areas will not resume as, as fast as, as we think it could. Some schools are taken over as um, you know, makeshift hospitals. And so there are many areas that we need to be mindful of that, that um, um, we need to focus a little bit more when it's the return to school uh, starts, uh, that we improve the, the situation, that the infrastructure there. This also provides an opportunity in, in many of the schools, the basic um, um, water, sanitation facilities, the hygiene facilities, uh, social distancing is, is, uh, is, is something very important, but we need to make sure that that is, in, in, is, is part of the response plan in that. Um, <clears throat> and we need to make sure that post COVID or even, even in during this situation that we build back better. It's not that going back to, I mean, have you been to schools um, and, and, and um, where there are no sanitation facilities? Uh, uh, it's extremely difficult for girls, especially we have seen it firsthand in many situations that they would go either to neighbors uh, houses or, you know, for, for just for those facilities and they become um, at, at risk even, even much more than, uh, than they are. Uh, so uh, all these uh, are part of part of the the discussion that we're having, but we just want to make sure that education is explicitly mentioned in every strategy as one of the priorities. Yes, health is obviously it's an emergency that we are looking at it, hygiene, social distancing, and all the rest. But as um, my fellow speakers mentioned, that connectivity is not everywhere available. That we can then talk about. Um, internet access and the tools that are available there. But education needs to be central in the list of priorities that we are now putting forward and which we are doing now uh, in the response strategies. So I, with there I stop and I'm happy to answer more questions if there are. Yes, thank you very much. We will have more questions from the from the chat from our viewers later on, but I would like to go a little bit more into the reflection with Mr. Munch. Um, Maybe you can you can tell um, our viewers and our panelists uh, why 
is the access to higher education is so important and also um, Germany is doing a lot already and there maybe what will the German foreign um, federal foreign office do in order to continue uh, to support refugee education. Are there planned new plans, new programs? And maybe you can give us a little bit of an insight what you're working at. Yes, well, thank you uh, again for giving me the opportunity to, to enter the discussion. This is um, indeed, I mentioned already uh, the programs and uh, Mr. Malik has again, again also raised this uh, DAFI program and I uh, I think uh, late lined out um, already that it is for us important <clears throat> to widen this program, to broaden it, and also to invite other partners to join this uh, ongoing program. Um, so this is one philosophy or one politic which we, which we are following and which we continue to follow also in the future. Um, it shows that for us, this educational issue is one of the main issues which we want to follow in the future. Um, <clears throat> DAFI is one example, it is a very important example. We have also other examples, for example, that um, Germany is also contributing additional funds to the Education Cannot Wait Fund, uh, um, and <clears throat> uh, which we have done already, but also with, when it comes to, um, to other um, areas of engagement, for example, making sure that um, uh, also participation of women in education and also um, um, in a, on a broader sense during the global or in, in the framework of the global action network for economic and political participation of women that this is ongoing and um, we launch uh, the launch of the um, um, uh, of the planned virtual format of this um, of this global action network is planned for autumn of this uh, of this year um, but let me maybe broaden a little bit the, the, the picture because um, we know that we are facing these problems not only but also now because of um, of the global pandemic and one of our efforts of course has to make be sure that we are coming that we will find a solution how we can well, find a vaccine actually and so our efforts are also concentrating on making sure that on several levels uh, work can continue on this issue. We are giving funding, for example, to um, WHO for, um, <clears throat> for their work, and uh, we have just increased our funding for their important work by 55 million euro. Um, we are also, um, in reaction to the UN COVID-19 Global Humanitarian Response Plan, um, also announced additional funding in a substantial um, uh, volume. Um, but it is important to network, to bring players together. Therefore, we have organized in beginning of May and in beginning of June two important international conferences, a virtual patching conference co-hosted by our Chancellor, Ms. Merkel, new commission and many others um, um, in May, where we have raised um, additional um, substantial uh, support for assistance to the um, um, to this pandemic and to um, develop vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics, and also the um, global vaccine summit in uh, early of June is another example of how important this also political interaction between several actors are very very important and we continue to do this also in future because um, part of our idea part of our philosophy as i mentioned earlier is we have to make sure that we're bringing people together institutions together not only state actors but <clears throat> to broaden really our view of who can help in these situations who can make their steps and we do see that it is a very, very strong need of international cooperation. So what we have seen at the beginning of the pandemic in some regions that actually um, international cooperation seems to come or to, an, to, a, to a, at least to a, to a temporary um, hold, um, the opposite is necessary. We need more, a tremendous uh, more international um, cooperation and when it comes to finding solutions to these and also to other global challenges. So this is a very important um, 
broader aspect of our work, making sure that international cooperation in the field of education, of science, of research will be strengthened. And we do think we can do this also by um, strengthening structures on the ground. Um, that means that it is not only necessary that we continue to support projects uh, which find vaccine programs, etc., but that it is important to um, invest and to support um, structures which exist already or which we might build up um, on the ground in regions like Africa, in regions like Asia, in regions like uh, Europe, and to um, strengthen the um, networking between these structures and the cooperation between uh, these uh, uh, structures, because they show, or this gives, according to our view, a stronger resilient response to what we are now facing. And again, what we are facing is a global challenge, but it is not the only global challenge. So therefore we have continued to do uh, this work of um, networking, of cooperating and uh, strengthening structures abroad. For example, we have one program which we are now in, uh, which we are planning to set up new centers for uh, challenging um, uh, climate change, uh, new centers, uh, global centers, which we are setting up in different countries um, together with their partners on the ground um, on um, uh, fighting um, um, pandemics like, like uh, COVID. So with this, maybe I will give it back and um, waiting, of course, for additional questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Münch. And um, we are coming to our last video, the fourth one. And this video is from Germany and it highlights the vocational training program for refugees at Volkswagen. Please. Arbeiten hier bei VW am ersten Jahr war nicht so einfach. Ich habe die ganze Zeit wie ein Mann gearbeitet, so richtig hart. Ja, Volkswagen engagiert sich seit 2015 äh, mit Flüchtlingshilfemaßnahmen ganz am Anfang wirklich aus Akuthilfe-Aspekten. Ähm, und wir haben daraus ein langfristiges Engagement gemacht. Und heute liegt der Fokus eher auf Bildungs- und Begegnungsmaßnahmen, weil wir dazu beitragen wollen, dass Geflüchtete den Lückenschluss schaffen, ähm, hin zu einer deutschen Ausbildung oder zu einem deutschen Arbeitsplatz. Ich arbeite nicht nur für mich, sondern für meine Familie, für meine Eltern, für mein Kind. Ja, es ist auch wichtig für meine Familie. Die sind stolz auf mich. We are back. Thank you very much. I liked I liked the the, the sentence where she said, uh, "I am working like a man." I like that. Well, we we, we women we are working like men all the time, not only in the pandemic. And um, I would like to uh, 
ask Emma. Emma, you are um, at Save the Children. You are um, responsible for the education in emergencies and you are also uh, advocacy advisor at Save the Children. Could you give us a little bit of the advocacy points and uh, maybe a little bit also your thoughts uh, on the videos we have seen, the four ones. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I mainly work on policy and advocacy on education in emergencies and particularly education for refugees. I think some of the, the major advocacy points that I wanted to make are firstly that we should be very much listening to what refugee children and youth want what their needs are um, make sure that we have very good um, close relationships and that we are acting on what they're saying. Um, we should make sure we take the time to do that and do it in an inclusive way to make sure we get a really strong perspective from lots of different refugees in different circumstances um, who may experience the challenges of getting a good education in different ways and we need to kind of deal with those complex challenges that they face. So that's, that would be my first point. Um, secondly, I would say international funding for education in emergencies has always been a very major challenge. Um, just two to three percent of humanitarian funding goes to education. So it's really, really small amounts of funding. And it's been at this level for a number of years now. Um, we really need to see that increase to around six to ten percent of humanitarian funding. I know the EU has now committed to spend at least 10% of its humanitarian funding on education, but we really need other bilateral donors to do the same. And it's even more important than ever before because COVID brings so many challenges on top of this already large learning and funding crisis that we are facing. And uh, so um, we're in our report in a few weeks, we'll actually be saying kind of what the funding gap is now, and we'll be making recommendations to bilateral donors, but as well as to multilateral donors as well. Um, Education Cannot Wait was already just mentioned, and Germany has been a big supporter of Education Cannot Wait, and we really encourage you to make another strong um, commitment this year, as well as we call on other donors to make similar commitments to Education Cannot Wait, because it is the main fund that is uh, working in education and emergencies responses around the world and working very closely with civil society organizations and UN agencies to implement um, programs to reach the most marginalized children and youth in humanitarian contexts. And it has been adapting its programs to deal with the COVID uh, pandemic too. Um, I wanted to just touch on, you know, a lot of the videos that have been shown today have focused on technology. And of course, um, you know, we should make sure that we increase um, the access to technology and increase Wi-Fi. But I do think that in many contexts uh, that refugees are living, there are very limited access to um, any kind of technology or Wi-Fi connection. And so, of course, we should maintain, uh, we should continue to make sure that um, access is increased. But we can't wait for access to be increased uh, for technology. In the meantime, we must make sure that learning is continued through paper-based materials, um, through making sure that teachers are well-trained. We mustn't forget teachers in this pandemic too. They are also very much struggling um, to make sure that they can also have their salaries paid, but also that they um, have the training and the support needed to continue to reaching out to the children that they want to teach. So um, I would really want to uh, sort of focus again on teachers and um, their well-being needs during this crisis as well. Many of them will be at home, um, with children, their own children, and trying to homeschool their children at the same time as trying to make sure that the children they would normally teach in their classroom are also getting a good education and are supported in their well-being. Thank you very much, Emma. Maybe the combination of the old-fashioned learning, old-fashioned education and the digital education will be the mixture and maybe the solution. I would like to um, go into, we, we have seen a lot of um, digital education in the videos and of course the challenges refugees face uh, in countries like Jordan or Africa. Um, Mr. Ernst, um, will investment in education continue? Can you say that from the point of Chiron and what expertise um, do state institutions need to continue with that? 
Well, that's a big question. <laughs> let, let, let me start with uh, saying that I completely agree with Emma Wagner. Uh, so to say, I can't agree more. Uh, and in particular, I would like to stress the, the point of uh, teacher training. Um, I think to support and improve teacher training, uh, so the, the, the very normal one, but also in terms of blended learning and, and digital learning, facilitating online classes, so all kinds of uh, teaching uh, and therefore professional development for uh, teachers uh, would be a very, very good investment uh, with a very good, so to say, return on investment, uh, especially long term. So I very much agree with this and would like to, to stress this even further. Um, well, I think uh, uh, it's not only about state institutions, coming back to your question. Um, I think uh, it's, it's uh, a question for all of us. Um, uh, and it's, I think there's not an easy answer uh, to, to find the money, to provide the money, and to do the right thing. Um, and uh, let's say, Karen, uh, we know a lot about online learning. But uh, if it comes to the concrete circumstances in camps, the local circumstances, the culture. Uh, so there are so many bottlenecks or, or challenges uh, where we do have our expertise in online learning and in curating content, um, but we need the help of, uh, let's say, other institutions, local institutions, other actors. I think it was already said, we have to work together. Uh, and, and just to name one example, more, to, more from Karen inside, we do have offices in Jordan and in Beirut. Uh, and uh, this is so exciting and so interesting to talk with our colleagues and to learn from each other and uh, to try to find solutions which are, are much better by delivering, developing these together than just here or there. Uh, I think this is very valuable. And we have to uh, develop this culture within our, our organizations. We have to be evidence-based in this regard. And we have to be maybe even more open in yeah, building up alliances uh, working together and uh, trying to achieve collective impact in a scalable and more sustainable way. Uh, and the more effective uh, our offerings are, uh, yeah, maybe the stronger the case is to fund them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, Bahati, you are a former refugee, you are a DAFI graduate, and you also are an employee of UNHCR. And um, from all this support you got, you could become a nurse. Um, of course, there was an investment in you, in your personal life. Um, could you give us uh, maybe um, some examples how uh, investment can be improved that uh, more people can make it like you did. Wow, thank you so much for that question. And I am actually currently a refugee. My status has not changed. And you are right, a lot was put into my education and my journey in education. And it took a lot for me to actually get to where I am right now. Um, in terms of investments, I mean, with COVID-19, a lot of the gaps have been brought to the light. We see what has been working and we also see what has not been working. Um, a lot of refugee youth, a lot of refugees actually are contributing to the response because they have been empowered in one way or another by education. And I understand that resources are very limited, as someone has mentioned, there's very little percentage of humanitarian aid that goes to education. But there's also the endless possibility, the unexplored possibility that we see now that had more people been given an education, you know, more people would be helping, more people would be contributing. And the best thing about education is that there is a lot of growth that comes with that. There's a lot it does in terms of broadening one's mind, broadening one's perspective of things. And you know, investing in giving refugees or anyone for that matter, critical skills, life skills, you know, skills such as 
critical thinking, problem solving. I can sit down, look at my community and see something that is not working. And I am in a position to see that as a problem and come up with a solution. And you can only do this with an education. If your mind is, is you know, is primed towards thinking in that direction. So I think that now more than ever, we understand that every contribution counts. Every contribution comes, whether it is from a citizen, whether it is from a refugee, whether it is from a woman, whether it is from a man, we're all in this together. And the more we build one another to reduce our different vulnerabilities, then the better we are, the better placed we are to, you know, uplift one another. I would encourage us stakeholders, policymakers who are here to think of ways, you know, to empower one another, empower refugees. Think of how we can even switch towards the informal skills, you know, empowering refugees with life skills that can be applicable in any situation. Formal education is very expensive and is competitive. So of course, funding, funding will not be available for all the refugees who are in need, but there is something else we can give to them that will be less costly. We can teach tailoring, we can teach mechanics, we can teach different kinds of skills that as long as refugees are put in a classroom, as long as they are put in positions where they can address problems and find a solution for them, their mind is opened. And uh, in the last video, I think the lady called Mastura mentioned how she likes learning new skills. And I am also like that. I don't know if it comes from being a refugee, but I recognize the need to have skills, the need to learn how to cook, the need to learn how to do hair. And I tell this to my friends jokingly, you know, in case anything happens and I can't work in an office and I can't, you know, do anything, I can cook, I can sell food, you know, I can do hair, I can make money. I have collected so many skills that can be backups for myself and for my family. And these are things I can teach to other refugees. These are, these are skills that will be helpful to other refugees, you know. So... There is a lot we can do, even with limited funding. There is a lot of empowerment that comes with just sitting in a classroom, and that's what we should strive for. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Bahati. Thank you. Now we um, we we got a lot of questions from our viewers, um, very similar questions, and uh, my colleagues in the back, you can see they um, they put them together for me. And um, the first one from a viewer, what was the first question goes to. Um, Mr. Malik, um, a viewer asks, how can refugees cope with the difficult situation of having lost income and uh, livelihoods? And what can governments of host countries do? Yeah, that, that's a, a, a very, unfortunately, a very common question that we're getting from across the globe. Um, um, as I mentioned in, in my earlier statement that uh, <clears throat> uh, large number of refugees are uh, dependent on daily wages. Um, about 97% of them get in, 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 in a private sector uh, where they go out and get their income and um, earn and then look after their families and, and work on that. With the lockdown, uh, with these opportunities gone, a lot of these refugees are finding themselves in extremely, extremely difficult situation. We can see it in the MENA region, we can see it in Africa, we can see it in the Latin America region. It's a situation which is impacting refugees globally. We have call centers where um, refugees call us and, uh, and, and bring their problems to our attention. And this is, again, another global phenomenon that the calls to our centers has exponentially increased. People who have never called us are beginning to call us. These are refugees who were self-reliant, were looking after their families, were paying their rents, were sending their kids to school, were even having small assets um, that they are now beginning to lose all of that and not sure what to do next because then it becomes extremely hard for them to, to look after their families. So they reach out and the, the, the most difficult part of it is that um, they have 
reaching out to UNHCR, our call centers in different countries, where they felt they would never had a need to go, go there other than for their protection documents and, and, and legal status on that. And we, we realized that this is an absolutely a, a massive uh, um, need that is out there. So we're doing a few things. One, we have um, expanded our cash program in these countries. Uh, in, in a number of operations, we have now 30 new operations where cash has been in, introduced. The cash for education, cash for multi-purpose, uh, cash for uh, emergency support. This is now a cash a, a program which is expanded in a number of countries. We also now reaching out to other partners to make sure that refugees are included in their response. Most importantly, response of national governments, uh, development partners. There are a number of uh, uh, um, assistance packages are going to these countries that we want to make sure that they take refugees into this uh, response plan. Uh, the High Commissioner for Refugees, who is very much uh, um, sort of uh, on top of these things to make sure that we, we uh, reach out to all our interlocutors. So he's reaching to the World Bank, to the IMF, to other development partners, bilateral donors, because the, the challenges are enormous. Now, in, in terms of at the local level, we are trying to um, um, create livelihoods opportunities where they're possible. In, 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 in situations where the opportunities exist that they can have some income and, some, and some, some work that is done. I think it goes back to the same issue that if the uh, host communities are equally in a very destitute situation that the community support goes in, that the communities are supported in a way that it serves both refugees and their host, uh, host together. Thank you very much. The next question goes to Emma. Um, how can one cope with all the hardships in an emergency response? So you are asked. So I think this is um, a question from refugee a refugee who's asking about how to cope or about how do responders. Yeah. Um, I think it's very, really incredibly challenging to be able to cope already um, refugees um, in many places are under difficult circumstances. Um, as we've already heard, you know, their livelihoods um, are often in the informal sector, um, which can be um, quite uncertain and uh, change, the circumstances can change quite a lot. Um, obviously with COVID, we now have, as Mr. Malik has said, you know, um, many workplaces have closed, the informal sector has closed as well. And so I think um, we really need to find ways to make sure that we are reaching the most marginalised refugees who are finding it very difficult to cope. Um, and they may be even disabled refugees or girls or particular groups of refugees that are even more marginalised that we need to make sure that we are in touch with and are able to respond with programmes to reach them with. I think um, in terms of coping with mental health and um, psychosocial support needs, there are a number of different um, programs out there and um, Save the Children runs a program that's been quite effective in, in normal times called um, HEART, her, um, which is healing and education through the arts, which we do a lot with children and young people and can be done with adults as well together with their children, which is about doing lots of different kinds of activities around art, drama, um, lots of different kinds of fun activities for children that can help them um, talk about their emotions, um, how to deal with them. And it's a nice way for parents to engage with their children as well. So we've been trying to adapt that program to um, co this COVID pandemic. Usually we do it in person in, in workshops, but we've been providing a lot of um, guidance uh, through hand materials, um, but also through kind of WhatsApp messaging and on radio about how to, parents can be engaging with these activities with their, with their children at home, using just any kind of basic things they may have in their house to kind of engage with their children, ask how they're feeling and to help continue talking. And I think that's been quite effective. Um, but I would definitely um, also echo what Mr. Malik has said about cash transf transfers. This has been incredibly important for many uh, refugee families and will be increasingly more important, I think, when schools start to open, as we want to make sure that every single child does return back to school. And even those children, um, refugee children who have not been in school before, we must really try and find a way to ensure that 
those children can also find a way to return back to school. So cash transfers could be quite a good way of doing that to ensure that families feel they have the income they need to ensure that they can send their children to school and don't need to be kept at home to deal with um, yeah, care responsibilities or working. So I would, um, yes, make the, make the case for more support for cash transfers and for mental health and psychosocial support. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, we talked about that earlier, about countries with low connectivity. And uh, the next question goes to Tobias Ernst. Um, how can you still provide online education in countries with low connectivity? The viewer asks. Yeah, um, in, in my statement earlier, uh, I only elaborated on, let's say, one pathway to tackle this challenge, which is improving connectivity, improving bandwidth. And uh, I still make the pitch for this. But of course, uh, as long as connectivity is not there in an uh, available amount, in an in insufficient uh, way uh, and access, uh, of course, we have to see uh, what we can do uh, technically and, and yeah, in terms of pedagogy also uh, to deliver and to overcome this barrier. And uh, what we did, uh, just to name some, some measures uh, we, we put into place, what we did is that we uh, minimized uh, the size of our app, uh, for example. And uh, it is possible to make the app you, you have to use or you like to use uh, for, for gaining access uh, to the current campus, it is possible to make this app much smaller than a usual app you will find in an app store. So uh, another way is to uh, enable download uh, functionalities so that you can download content uh, when you are online, uh, but then you uh, study, so to say, offline. And if you have access later on, uh, or maybe even via SMS, you can synchronize you are your learning activities, your learning outcomes with the central server, therefore gain access to certification, uh, even if you have not a good internet access. Uh, so there are some technical possibilities. You can make use of flash, flash drives, for example. Uh, we, we set up uh, currently some uh, collaborations with other partners to deliver more on, on USB sticks uh, to have content available this way. You can enable peer-to-peer -peer, uh, Wi-Fi so that one person is doing the download and then he can share via Bluetooth or other technologies the content uh, to, to other uh, devices where the, the app is installed uh, and, and they don't have to go online for this purpose but can then take it away and share again in the next village, for example. So there are some opportunities. And uh, we, we call our campus uh, an inclusive campus. And we mean by this that we want to make use of technological opportunities to overcome low connectivity as much as possible. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question for Bahati. That's very interesting. Um, we heard that you are also working voluntary in a hospital in Nairobi, in Kenya. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experiences during this COVID-19 pandemic? Wow, <laughs> very good question. Um, yes, so part of my um, nursing training is that I have to do one year placement in a government hospital um, so that I can get my nursing license. So that's how I ended up in the hospital. And, um, you know, the, the well, COVID-19 hit us in March, and that was at the height of my rotation. And um, it was very interesting to see how everything shifted and how the whole atmosphere changed, even in our hospitals. There was um, the, the atmosphere of fear and worry, you know, and everyone was anxious about the future, about this virus, but also there was some form of strength coming from the, the healthcare workers, the nurses and the doctors, you know, everyone thinking of, how they can help support the system, what else we can do to improve our services. And you know, this pandemic also was able to point out the gaps that we have even in our healthcare systems. So it was a really, really, it has been a really growing experience for me, even uh, as my, in my career as a nurse. And uh, I remember the first time we got uh, a patient in the ward where I was working, it was, wow, it was crazy because everyone is scared. You know, we don't know what to do with the patient, but also you still have compassion because this is a patient who is 
you know, it was a lady who had just delivered a baby via C-section and uh, she had all the symptoms and, you know, everyone was so scared to get near her. We couldn't put her with the other patients, but, you know, having come from a surgery, she needed care. And, you know, I remember as the, as the nurses, we were talking about who is going to take care of her and everyone was surprised when I volunteered. And, you know, I had to say, this is a privilege for me to take care of her and show her kindness because she must be scared, you know? She must also be worried about her condition, about her baby. And you know, when I went into the room, I was all covered and I had all the other nurses watching us from the, from the glass window. <laughs> it was very interesting. And you know, when I opened up her, her bedding, you know, it was, there was blood all over, you know, her baby was crying, she was crying because she didn't have breast milk and all that hullabaloo. But I got a few moments with her just to tell her it's okay, just to explain to her why, you know, she's isolated, why everything is different and just calm her down. And, you know, by the time I was leaving there, she was calmer, you know, she felt taken care of, she felt accepted whether she was positive or not, she felt taken care of. So for me, I felt so empowered, you know? I felt, it felt great that I could give someone that kind of comfort, that I, with my education, I am in that place of privilege to show love and to show kindness. I mean, you know, it's priceless, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving us this, this, um, this picture how beyond numbers we read in the newspapers and you guys draw a picture of how it is to, to work with these people and which, um, yeah, people, it's like human beings and the uh, emotions you get. And when you read about the pandemic in the newspapers, you read a lot of statistics, you read a lot of numbers and we sometimes forget uh, the human beings behind this number. Thank you so much, Bahati, for this insight of your work. And our last question goes to Mr. Munch, and um, that's a closing question, and maybe we, um, it's, it's a nice question also with um, closing this question and answer part. If somebody is asking, we are having many students online from all over the world. What would you like to tell them? <laughs> Thank you. That's really a nice question for at the end of this part of the session. Well, um, I mean, first, what I would like to, or what, what I observed today is something very, um, very encouraging. It is by far the largest um, audience which I see have been so far collected by a event of the Long Night of Ideas. And, um, it is, I think, the third long night of ideas. It's a very recent uh, and a new uh, format which we have introduced. And it is so fantastic to see this uh, huge international participation by all of you. And, um, and uh, I think this is very encouraging to continue because, again, the idea is to come together to share ideas, information, questions, and um, to continue to think about what we have heard and uh, to be uh, on what is needed because we need this input for our um, in the way we are forging our politics and um, uh, therefore this is important to to continue discussions to continue uh, this kind of uh, connecting with each other um, continue your studies continue your work uh, be really strong in your work and invest your time invest your your energy in this. It is uh, very, very important uh, what you are doing and, um, and also don't forget to, um, yes, to uh, engage yourself also in, um, in your social environment. Thank you so much. And um, well, I'm happy that you will continue then later in the outbreak sessions. So. Thank you so much, Mr. Munch. We have we had a, really a lot of questions and um, um, my colleagues, they put them together and I hope we could uh, send the main issues, the main topics of these questions to you. Um, I would like to thank all the viewers for sending us your question and making it clear for the panelists, for our guests, which topics are important for you. Um, and I also will, would like to express my sincere thanks to our speakers and panelists. Thank you very much for the professional insights of 
your work, your special work. And thank you also to you wherever you watch us. Um, it was for me a great pleasure and I learned a lot and uh, above all I saw how much is being done in refugee education despite the pandemic. We will now take a short break until noon, until 12 o'clock, and then we will continue with the breakout sessions with a special focus on the participation of refugee students and UNHCR staff and partners at the country level. One last technical information for you with the breakout sessions. Our video protagonists are available for your questions and uh, for the breakout sessions there is a separate link you can find. I think Fabienne put the link inside and uh, you can dial in with this, uh, with this link and on our event page you can also find the virtual refugee conference where you can reg register for tomorrow for the big refugee day. So um, the breakout sessions will focus on Jordan, West Africa, East and Southern Africa and Germany and will allow attendees to participate in discussions and question and answers with our panelists. Well, now it's time for me to say goodbye and I would like to close this session with a Turkish proverb. My heritage is Turkish. I was born in Germany. I was raised in Germany. And my parents came in the 60s to Germany as guest workers, how you call them here in Germany. So that's why I speak also Turkish. And um, according to this very old Turkish proverb, it says, a pen stands above the sword. And I think that's a great proverb close this session and thank you very much. Thank you having you all here. Thank you to the viewers from all over the world who watched us and have a great day and have fun at the breakout sessions. Thank you. Goodbye. 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 Thank you again. Thank you very much you. all of us. Thank you. Uh, Bahati, um, absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.